Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, uh, pretty, pretty interesting work and uh, a lot of useful uh, tools. I anticipate we'll be working a lot uh, going forward. Um, again, my name is uh, Mahmoud Sharar. I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist working here at the North Carolina State University. Uh, the, my responsibility is primarily working in improving animal waste management practices. And uh, North Carolina did come up quite a bit in the presentation before. So there's quite a bit of work to do. Uh, in my presentation today, I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the nutrient inventory uh, development effort that I've been involved in with a group uh, of collaborators. And also, I will present after that a case study of uh, using this information to develop an intervention to address nutrient imbalances. Um, I'd like to start generally by this uh, kind of a graphic that illustrates the scale or how animal agriculture in general plays out across multiple spatial scales and temporal scales as well. Uh, so you can see generally uh, for this particular group and certainly for producers, the scope is generally the farm uh, limits, uh, crop and uh, animal storage and management, but generally the movement of commodities and production inputs uh, crosses a lot of boundaries as you can see in this graphic from the uh, watershed to a county, uh, state, uh, national and global boundaries. And uh, not all the products and byproducts cross these boundaries. And oftentimes when these, um, some byproducts similar to manure or emissions to air and soil and water uh, cross boundaries, we would, would rather they wouldn't, then lies the challenge or the problem. Also over long periods of time or time horizons, uh, some buildup and accumulation uh, takes place. So that's important to emphasize that a lot of the nutrient uh, imbalances that we are seeing uh, in a lot of places around the country, uh, it took um, years for them to actually manifest and will relatively take uh, long periods of time to address, um, drawing down some of the le legacy phosphorus stakes uh, as you've seen in the earlier presentation. So um, if we zoom to specifically on uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and there's a reason why typically we talk about nitrogen and phosphorus, they are the two of the major nutrients that are used um, in uh, anthropogenic activities, human uh, and agriculture alike. If we look down into the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus production, you'll realize quickly that um, feed and fertilizer uh, consumes by far the largest share of synthetic ammonia produced and also from phosphorus rock or phosphate rock mine. So uh, in addition to uh, these sources, our synthetic nitrogen uh, and phosphorus sources, there are other sources too, atmospheric deposition, biofixation uh, for nitrogen, or the recycling of industrial human waste and, and municipal waste as well. Uh, the, the, while nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are really important for crop production, their um, buildup or accumulation in a lot of places or lands, la landscapes can result in um, uh, contamination issues. That loss can play out through runoff, erosion, uh, leaching, or in the case of nitrogen, can also uh, be a result of bottleization. Th that accumulation can lead to eutrophication, water quality issues, and depending on whether we're talking about fresh water or uh, marine water, also particulate matter formation in the case of ammonia, and, and finally groundwater quality um, deterioration. And as a, as a counter to try to mitigate these impacts, we generally uh, resort to nutrient planning. Nutrient planning is primarily relevant in the context of agricultural production systems. It essentially ensures that the, all the growing crops have the sufficient uh, uh, nutrients they need or animal units, animals have the sufficient uh, nutrition nitrogen or phosphorus they need without an excess inputs to reduce any uh, loss or accumulation in the landscape. Nutrient planning, in, in the case of animal agriculture, can be mandatory uh, for certain production units that exceed a certain capacity of animal production, or what the term is typically CAFOs, or concentrated animal feeding operations. A, a lot of times when we step outside of the farm boundary, we find ourselves in need of developing other sophisticated tools that um, encompass more landscape. And that's where the, the concept of inventories and budget comes in place. Essentially, it's a way to conceptualize the flows of all of the nutrients across the landscape over a period of time to help develop interventions and reduce that imbalance. You can see on the right that this is a, a schematic representation of that, what that balance would look like. And uh, you can see clearly there are uh, 
recycling of uh, organic waste uh, crop residue that uh, uh, possibly can uh, move nutrients, but by and large, the import and export imbalance can be the critical source of the deficiency or accumulation. And uh, again, we can develop these budgets across different landscapes, spatial landscapes. So farm gate is the most common one, and we develop that. There's also the county, watershed, and state or national levels. I go a little bit into which spatial scales will be relevant. And um, uh, the, the argument that I present and the, the work that the Rob presented earlier also sort of uh, uses the watershed uh, or hydrologic boundaries as the basis. But here I emphasize the reasons why that will be more relevant. So especially when we talk about manure management or organic waste, uh, by definition, a lot of these uh, products are not very valuable or they are val as valuable as the embedded nutrients. Typically, they contain high water content. And as a result, they're not very economical to transport longer distances. In other words, uh, if we uh, assume a larger boundary or a spatial scale to develop these nutrient budgets, we will be overlooking a lot of the hot spots that actually are a result of these shorter transportation distances. Uh, also, uh, when we think about the nutrient losses to the landscape in, uh, through uh, erosion or runoff of dissolved nutrients, most of that actually happens within the boundary of the watersheds, uh, streams, catchments, uh, to river basins and such which aligns nicely with the use of these watershed boundaries. And finally, uh, is the use of these uh, inventories or budgets can seamlessly be integrated into uh, water uh, modeling tools or uh, total maximum daily loading, uh, a lot of the instruments that are used to, to regulate or improve water quality. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I came across, and I suspect any other uh, researchers uh, attempting that work, uh, came across is the fact that most of the agricultural data in terms of the animal agriculture stocks or the crop uh, yields and acreage are compiled on a state and county level. Uh, they use these uh, administrative boundary systems and that becomes a challenge. So uh, the first part that I'll present to you is some of the effort that we undertook to try to adopt a lot of the data that we have available uh, from the administrative boundaries that are already available to the watershed where they will be most useful. Uh, so this is sort of a rundown of the key data sources um, that were involved in this effort. Uh, some of this data are um, uh, crop yields, acreage, and nutrient uptake. Uh, many of these data sets are available through the Department of Ag um, statistical uh, surveys and also from the NRCS databases. As well, we looked into the livestock inventories across counties and we used the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers uh, data sets and standards to develop the nutrient content and manure production rates for animal uh, units. We also looked into USGS uh, data sets that compiles the fertilizer use. And uh, for crops, we started to use uh, some geospatial data sets to actually carry out that conversion between the municipal boundaries of counties and state into the uh, hydrologic boundaries, uh, which is watersheds. So in this slide, uh, I'll present primarily the data um, that we've generated for the state of Wisconsin. So here you see on the left, the administrative boundaries representing the state and the county boundaries. And then on the right-hand side, you see the huck tent, or what represents the watershed. And quickly realize the difference in size and the number of units um, can uh, reveal a lot of trends um, that wouldn't obvious under the using the county boundaries. So uh, using this uh, boundary uh, to uh, convert from one boundary to the next, we actually one of the first tools we've relied on is the geospatial data set that is the crops cropped soil. And uh, this Uh, this distribution of nutrients, um, as you can see on the colored map on the left, represents the distribution of the key crops that are grown in the state of Wisconsin. The top uh, six crops uh, represented by co corn, soybean, alfalfa, and hay, each is encoded in a different color code. And on the right-hand side is basically adopting this uh, color code into a density map that represents where is the agricultural taking place. And using that distribution, we can use geospatial uh, analysis tools to actually 
uh, survey different uh, boundary units to get an idea of converting data from uh, one data basis, which is the county level, to a watershed. The results of this geospatial manipulation is actually used to de develop what I'm calling here a uh, transformation matrix for this data sets. It's a little bit of algebra, but it's very straightforward. Basically, uh, this will be a set of factors or multipliers that will be used to um, convert to the data sets that we have already into watershed boundaries. That represents the effort uh, as far as the uh, crop production. But then when we start looking into the animal agriculture, where the farms are, that presents another challenge. And um, that's uh, towards the uh, end of my talk, you'll see that this becomes a challenge because different states have different rules related to uh, disclosure of the location of animal operations. And that presents a challenge of actually getting uh, a point or a spatial uh, reference to allocate animal units. So in this data sets that we have uh, available for the state of Wisconsin, where that work took place, uh, there are two types of classifications of farms. So there is the uh, CAFO or concentrated animal feeding operations, and those are typically uh, available uh, for most states in terms of location and, and herd sizes. And on the right-hand side, you can see the distribution of smaller dairy operations. Uh, Wisconsin is known for being the dairy land of America. A lot of uh, dairy operations are there are small to medium range in terms of the animal size, uh, the size of animals on the facility. And as such, the, we only had available the uh, locations of the farms and not exactly the uh, herds available. So we had to do a computational step where we allocated the county inventories to these units and assuming they are relatively of a uniform size, uh, as long as they are below um, the CAFO uh, uh, threshold. Using this data, our inventory focused primarily on the agricultural uses, and uh, as such, we only focused on uh, manure, uh, fertilizer, and crop uptake. Um, and on the next couple of slides, I will show you the preliminary results looking strictly on the balance. And this is one of the key indicators we typically look into when we look uh, uh, into nutrient balances in agriculture is nutrients or nitrogen embedded in the manure produced uh, related to the uptake. Generally, this ratio uh, needs to be um, uh, quite low, below one, uh, for the obvious reasons, because manure is not the only source of nitrogen supply to growing crops. As you can see here, there are certain areas of, of heavy production of uh, uh, dairy and uh, correspondingly manure concentration. The Fox Valley area in, uh, around Green Bay in the central Sands area of Wisconsin as well. Uh, but when we transform from the county basis to the uh, HUC, uh, HUC 10 basis, you get to see actually that the balance, you start to identify certain hot spots, um, and the imbalance actually moves to a higher level, which essentially confirms our um, instinct that using this boundary will help us zoom in closer on specific uh, watersheds that require improvements in management. And, and the same applies for phosphorus here, as you can see, um, uh, compared uh, to nitrogen, there are certain hotspot areas where phosphorus um, is accumulated as a result of uh, the buildup of nutrients. And uh, the second part of my presentation to you today will focus primarily on uh, using this information to actually develop an intervention or to solve a challenge. Uh, this, uh, this challenge was primarily the uh, manure storage capacity. Uh, in brief, uh, dairy production, as you have seen uh, in, in Wisconsin, is pretty uh, spread across the state. And, and knowing the climate in Wisconsin, there is a, a window over winter where land application is not recommended. It's actually uh, uh, prohibited in certain states, but in Wisconsin, there is not a clear regulatory uh, limit on a winter application. Many producers resort to winter application of manure simply because of the storage limitation and that there aren't uh, manure storage uh, facilities that they have on farm. And, and um, this specifically came about because of the water quality. So this here represents the uh, Vihara watershed, in, uh, watershed in south central Wisconsin where the uh, state capital Madison resides. This chain of lake, uh, lakes are part of that Vihara watershed. And uh, because of the algal blooms and the increased phosphorus deposition to this uh, chain of lakes, uh, 
a lot of the studies looked into the contribution of the different uh, land uses and agriculture was identified to be the key uh, contributor and specifically agronomic practices in the upper part of the watershed. And uh, as a, uh, an intervention, there was a need to actually try to answer a key question. For a lot of farms in this particular watershed that do not have uh, sufficient manure storages to last during the winter, what would be the ideal location or placement and capacity of storage that could be provided to actually achieve an improvement in the water quality in this watershed? So uh, what we did, we formulated this into an optimization problem where the goal was to actually try to identify the number and the sizes of the different storages. And they are represented by gray circles in the middle to regulate the transport of nutrients between the sources that are livestock operations and the sinks represented by agricultural. Plants. As you see here, we've chosen two different colors to represent. There are certain farms with local storage lagoons or storage ponds available where they don't need to resort to winter application and uh, ones that do not have uh, uh, storage capacity. So as you can see, to, to attempt to solve or to answer this question, there was a lot of data needed and that's where the inventories uh, uh, that we are developing came into play. So uh, this briefly presents to you uh, sort of an idea of that watershed. So you see here in the middle, the, it's primarily an urban uh, watershed. Upper and uh, uh, lower uh, Yahara River are primarily agricultural uh, production. And on the right-hand side, you see the map that represents where the dairy uh, or the entire livestock production system is located. And by, by far, the concentration of animal production happens in the upper uh, Yahara uh, sub-watersheds. And that's where we uh, focused our uh, analysis. So most of the animal units and, and the farms are located on those two uh, sub-watersheds. So accordingly, we delineated this as our study area and we started to inventory the number of farms and we have a complete data set for this particular watershed. So we know locations and number of animals in every year. And we used um, uh, uh, estimates of the herd structure between heifers, lactating cows and dairy, uh, dry cows to get an estimate of the uh, concentration of phosphorus and nitrogen produced on every facility. The focus of this project was primarily phosphorus, and that's what we uh, presented on. But as you can see here, there was um, only 36% uh, of the manure was stored um, on, on storage facilities with, with a lot of smaller farms with, with in not enough uh, adequate storage to last during the winter. So that gives an idea of where is that distribution. So that's the sources part of the equation. The other part was to actually try to identify the sinks within this uh, study area. So we've relied on land ownership records and some of the lead, uh, land uh, use uh, data sets that are already available to delineate uh, which uh, parcels of land will actually be representative of agricultural production. As you can see here, what we have is uh, we've relied on these parcels of land that represents the crop uptake or nutrient removal, and we've compiled uh, spatial data layers to represent a continuous set, a seven year uh, of agricultural production on every uh, uh, lot of land to basically try to develop uh, a crop rotation, but not for one field, but for an entire uh, sub-watershed. And that uh, crop rotation was used uh, in combination with the nutrient uptake associated with every crop to get an estimate of nutrient removal uh, as an average and standard deviation for every parcel of land. Uh, we also had a data set available for validation. That's a key part to, to get a sense of the quality of the spatial data sets or the crop data layer um, and whether it actually uh, re reflects the actual crops being produced um, in the field. And that's been developed or the, the validation was carried out using um, uh, a windshield survey that has been carried out in 2010, which is a middle year in that the years of the crop rotations we've developed. And we found the agreement uh, adequate to describe um, the scope of the project. Uh, an additional step we've added to, aside from the sources and the sinks of nutrients or phosphorus in particular, we actually attempted to classify the fields in terms of their likelihood to contribute uh, to uh, phosphorus loss in, uh, as edge of field losses 
to streams and to the river and lake system. And we've used a composite of key uh, soil and hydrologic indicators for that. So we looked into the slope, which typically correlates with the runoff uh, and nutrient losses. Also looked into the uh, parcel proximity to the surface water. And we looked into the soil texture and we tried to uh, identify and exclude the internally draining fields from this um, assessment. And we didn't come up with a scoring, we came up with a binary system to identify whether uh, the field is deemed as sensitive or uh, deemed as not uh, sensitive to um, phosphorus loss. And using that, we incorporated that into that optimization criteria we've developed. Essentially, what would be the ideal uh, storage placement and capacity to minimize the manure application during winter on these sensitive fields. And as we all know, the uh, projects like this, the, the, we are not only optimizing for environmental quality, but the economic considerations are a key uh, factor in design, deciding the course of action. So in addition to the construction of added manure storages, we started to actually take into consideration the manure or the hauling of manure to the storages and from the storages to the land application. So that has been incorporated to try to optimize that placement to be closest as possible and reduce the transportation cost. And as a result, we've developed this into a um, two objective optimization. The goal is to reduce the application of gallons to sensitive uh, fields or crop fields we've identified as sensitive to phosphorus loss and also try to minimize the total hauling cost over uh, an entire year uh, as a result of this uh, practice. And we started to develop multiple scenarios to assess the sensitivity. Uh, what's the, um, when we removed the uh, capacity of these storages, we limited it to uh, tillium 10 million gallon capacity on one site. And then we started to uh, alternate the constraints of this model to get a sense of what would be the ideal points. There were two key uh, areas in the, that particular subwatershed that a lot of the farms, dairy farms with no storages were clustered around. The findings of this were compiled into a report that was communicated into um, the county agency, the funding agency for this, for action, and also that work has been uh, compiled into manuscript and uh, peer reviewed and published. Uh, the implications of that work, as you can see, um, there is a, a great opportunity to incorporate the results of modeling efforts that develop inventories into a more of a systematic framework. So the, the work that I presented to you, that case study, one of the key findings that we've realized is that for that particular subwater shed, uh, the, there was an actual net uh, accumulation of nutrients. So it's the storage alone will not actually address the challenge of the nutrient imbalances in this case. And that's where we advanced the, uh, the need for developing an export, nutrient export program for manure as it exists or incorporating a, a processing step to uh, export uh, uh, manure uh, and particularly phosphorus out of that particular watershed. Uh, on the right hand side here you see this is uh, a map from a uh, latest publication we've used the, the same data set to actually uh, develop a, a framework that uh, uh, leverages the same uh, basis um, that is used for uh, energy dispatch and deciding the clearing prices for electricity and energy generation into a similar framework to actually help in the nutrient distribution uh, from organic waste, uh, not just manures. And this represents a certain prices and distribution of the, these prices. And as you can see here, it mirrors rel relatively the hotspots by the uh, negative prices or ra rather the costs associated with removing uh, a ton of these organic wastes. You can also see that um, a lot of these projects require the availability of a lot of data sets. And when, when we attempt to, for instance, um, uh, identify a location of animal production facilities or the size of herds on animal production facilities, we start running into some sensitivities and uh, some considerations, including the need to anonymize some of the data. That's a key part why a lot of the data here are not identifying. Uh, to the producers to predict, protect uh, anonymity. Also, there, there is a possibility of actually not just assessing one form of intervention, uh, but actually comparing technologies to get a better sense of the uh, feasibility and where a technology might have an, uh, an advantage 
for implement, uh, implementation. And, um, and as you can see, there, there will be uh, a potential to actually not just model the, uh, uh, the technologies, but also uh, agricultural, the change in the crop rotations or in the animal densities across the landscape and how that uh, influences the nutrient balances. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, uh, return the, uh, the presentation back to Aaron for questions. And I'd like to share with you the two uh, publications where that work has been published. Thank you.